Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the LawCast. Today, we're going to be talking about Judgment Day 2004. Kyush, what are your thoughts on this show? Oh, my holy God. As we go through the show, I'm going to reveal fully and honestly my thoughts about this show. But as I said uh, to Law here when we were doing the pre-show, uh, this is basically just a bigotry checklist that you just go all the way down the line and just like, yep, 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 we got everybody. And, oh my God, it's ho- ho- it's so horrible, man. It's remarkable how much the tone of this company and its presentation has changed in 13 years because I feel like every single match on this show includes something that they would never even consider doing today. Absolutely. And it features people being used in ways that I, it's maddening to imagine that they thought that these were the right ways to use them. Like, it's not just that this is a bad show in a vacuum. This is a bad show in a sea of bad shows that just happens to be the one with the reputation for being the worst. 2004 was a pretty dire time for SmackDown. This felt like the time to me where SmackDown truly became the B show. For the first couple of years of the brand split, SmackDown had actually been better than Raw, but things took a really bad turn for them uh, in the early part of 2004, a spiral that it took them a while to recover from. And it must be mentioned <clears throat> that the, the good part of SmackDown was really under the direction of Paul Heyman. I don't know when during this year he actually gets fired as the head writer of SmackDown, but I think that the shows take a severe drop immediately afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, this show, it feels like if Heyman were in charge, he had a talent for using people in the right way and identifying talent, and I just can't imagine things would have got him uh, writing things. But so to set the stage, part of the reason we chose this show is is that a backlash this weekend, Jinder Mahal will be challenging uh, Rando B Championship. Uh, Jinder Mahal having kind of been plucked from the undercard and thrown into the main event, we decided to look back at another time where WB took a guy kind of from nowhere and put him in the main event, and that would be Judgment Day 2004, where uh, the John Bradshaw Layfield character was invented and put into the main event. Um, with very little build, but I think the difference between this time and last time is in 2004, SmackDown did not have a whole lot of options as to who was going to face Eddie Guerrero at this show, whereas today, SmackDown has, I think, plenty of options for who would face Randy Orton in a main event program, and they just happen to choose gender. Yeah, it definitely feels like it's way more premeditated this time than it was that time. I, I distinctly remember like seeing like the big nets for the JBL character and being like, I thought it was going to be like a mid Carter. I think most everybody did, and so when it went and became like all about Mexicans and was clearly aimed at Eddie Guerrero, I was super surprised. Nobody saw him as a character like this. Like even like maybe more so than Gender today, because Gender is still largely an unexplored guy. He hasn't really done much in general, whereas JBL had been around for fifteen years doing nothing. <laughs> Well, JBL at this point, they had tried singles pushes with him a couple times, and it, it had never really succeeded. But I, I will say that while his um, bring, bringing him up to the main event happened way too abruptly, I do think he is a really talented performer, especially as a heel, and that this JBL gimmick was a great one. Yeah, oh yeah, I would have to agree with that. Even if I will vociferously argue with making... The, the target of it be like the Mexican people right off the bat in order to feud him with Eddie Guerrero, having the obnoxious Republican gimmick, I mean, it's a strike of gold. Like, everyone hates that guy, and he plays it so amazingly well because he probably is it a little bit. Well, yeah, when they talk about how great characters are the real guy with the volume turned up, yeah, JBL and John Layfield do not feel like they're that far apart. No, they really don't. It's just a matter of uh, wanting to be on the road for JBL and then actual John Brad Layfield sitting on an island tweeting the ideas. It's the same ideas. <laughs> so to sort of go over what had happened to SmackDown the first three months of 2004, basically they got completely screwed. Uh, Chris Benoit ro- won the Royal Rumble but then was moved to Raw because Triple H needed some fresh challengers. 
Um, Kurt Angle had a bad neck and needed to have surgery and needed a couple months off. Uh, Big Show needed knee surgery and took some time off. And Brock Lesnar just abruptly decided he didn't want to wrestle anymore and retired after WrestleMania 20, which was, I, that's, I think, an underexplored event in the company's history, how big an impact that had. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, even if they had had Paul Heyman in charge and had had all the things lined up and everything going properly, I still don't know what exactly they would have done. Like, any time a promotion, even if it's just half of a promotion in this case, gets a talent drain like that, you're going to have a lot of crappy shows while they try to sort things out. I mean, that's just how it has to be. And in this case, like, I think it's the Lesnar thing that hurt the worst because they put everything into him. They fed everyone to him. And then, like, he only paid it back with Eddie, and that's it. He was going to be the top guy in the company for the next five years was clearly the plan. Like, WrestleMania 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, he probably would have been the main event of just about all of them. Without him, I don't know what happens with John Cena and what happens with Batista. They probably become stars anyway, but not... I'd, I don't even know if Cena would have been the top guy. I think it would have been Lesnar. Oh, I think it definitely would have been. It's actually funny because you look at Cena here and you think like, all right, Lesnar left and the next top star was Cena. But Cena's not even close to ready yet. He's not even close to the John Cena who's not going to be ready, but they're going to put him on top anyway. No, although he he's got crazy a long way. popular here. It's yes. weird to see him get cheered, but he is the crowd is insane for him here. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Um but just to sort of pose a question, what should or could WWE have done at this point after SmackDown loses, I guess we'd say, four of their top seven or eight talents? I think my initial reaction would be they probably should have just ended the brand split here because the reason they created the brand split was they had too many stars for one show. Losing those guys, plus they'd lost Austin Rock, Goldberg, they no Hogan, they no longer had that problem. They no longer had too many stars. This was a year where you were hearing about house shows where they were barely drawing a thousand people. They were so thin with two rosters. That's a good point because it's not just SmackDown. I mean, SmackDown was obviously way worse. But on Raw, you could tell too because it was just, it was basically evolution and no one for them to conceivably really feud with. And then they just started bringing in guys. Michaels and Benoit, and then, yeah, not yeah. a lot. Then they started bringing in guys to feed to Evolution, like Rock and Foley and Goldberg, because they just needed somebody, some name, and those guys would all go to Raw. So SmackDown really had nothing. Honestly, it, it would be like super easy and convenient to me to say that they should have just made some new stars, because they had guys with star power on this show. I mean, it wasn't time for Ray yet, but... As we get into the show, like, what the hell is Rob Van Dam doing in the opening match in a tag match when they're this hard up for star power? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's a real matchmaking mistake that they did Van Dam and Mysterio on a card this thin because they wasted three credible acts on a show where they only had a couple of them. Exactly. And that that's kind of more representative than anything. It's not just that they didn't have stars. It's that they didn't know how to make anything out of the stars that they actually had or the stars that they could potentially have. No one gets built during this time. They clearly say, like, the next big star isn't on the roster yet. Let's just bring up an endless supply of OVW guys and throw them at the wall. Absolutely. And a ton of guys didn't become the stars that it feels like they should have in this era. But... So what WWE decided to do was to do their first kind of shakeup of the rosters. They did a draft two weeks after WrestleMania. The expectation going in is SmackDown's going to get reloaded. Uh, here are SmackDown's picks in the draft. They got Rene Dupree, Mark Jindrak, Rob Van Dam, Teddy Long, Spike Dudley, and Triple H. But the Triple H thing was just a tease and he got traded back to Raw right away. Now let's not sleep totally on the picks of Rene Dupree and Mark Jindrak, because those were big prospects at that point in time. Like They were supposed to have great futures, they just didn't. Yeah, Jindrak was supposed to be an evolution before they changed their mind and put Batiste in. Instead, 
good call on that one. And Dupree was, you know, freaking 19 years old and you know, on a national TV roster. And while he was green, he wasn't that bad. That was definitely a guy they saw star potential in. No, if they had kept him going for another five years, I think he would eventually turn into a fantastic performer. They could but break three. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> five years from now, he's going to be in all Japan with a bunch of weird tattoos and a failed career. Yeah. Amazing how his career mirrored Alex Wright's. Yeah, it really did. Um, so like I said, Triple H got traded back to Raw for Booker T and the Dudley Boys, and there was also Chuck Palumbo going to Raw in exchange for Rico and Jackie Gata. And Raw in the draft got Shelton Benjamin, Nidia, Rhino, Tajiri, Edge, and Paul Heyman. Except Heyman never appeared on Raw. He just quit and went back to SmackDown. But that was their way of removing him as SmackDown general manager. Right. And obviously we all remember that Shelton Benjamin got a huge push out of this. But I mean, it's not a huge haul for Raw either. Especially since Edge wasn't quite exactly what he would wind up being. I mean, this is still feuding with Randy Orton Edge, not made of an Edge. But it, if Triple H stays on SmackDown, and I don't think they ever intended to do that, does well, that fix the problem? Yeah. SmackDown still would have been thin, but SmackDown needed a top heel, and it would have given them a credible top heel, and him and Eddie could have easily run for a couple months. They just needed to bridge the gap until Angle got back because Angle's back for SummerSlam. It's about a three-month period they need to fill. I think if Triple H is on this show, you can do Triple H and Eddie, you can do Triple H and Undertaker, eventually you can do Triple H and Cena, and that would have given the show credibility and star power, but it would have blown a huge hole in Raw at that point. Yeah. What's interesting is that they basically, with JBL, wind up doing the Triple H push and so at the same time, we basically have a Triple H on both shows. And that's this is when a lot of people stop watching wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, 2004 was a really rough year for their business. Um, Cena, I, I feel like my thought had always been that it's just, it was just kind of straight downhill for years and years and years. But I feel like this was where they really kind of hit a low point and things bounced back a little bit in 05 and 06 with... Cena and Batista becoming top stars. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's so sad that we're saying all of these things because Eddie Guerrero is the top star of this show now, and he doesn't do anything to deserve this. He's the guy who Lesnar puts over, not 100% clean, but that's in keeping with the character. He is maybe the most over baby face of this era. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> no, and... Um, based on what people have said who knew him at the time, he really took this all on himself that, like, I'm the top guy. we got to make this work. You know, we're not drawing, and it's my fault. And it's just like he got so utterly screwed here with having no one to work with. I don't think anybody could have made this work. Undertaker, obviously, is a huge, huge star, but he wasn't doing TV. He wasn't doing house shows. He made... I think one TV appearance in the run-up to this pay-per-view. Yeah, do you remember why that was? Because I don't know... Nope, I think it was just a booking decision that they're like, we want to make him more of a special attraction by never having him appear on TV. Yeah, I don't really... I don't like that decision because especially, like, that could have helped protect, protect Eddie. Or maybe they were just trying to be like, we'll make this Eddie show, it'll just be Eddie. But again, Eddie has to build a new top heel off of his, off of his back from scratch, where he's just a brand new baby face himself. It's just too much. Nobody's doing this. No, couldn't have worked. So they look at their roster, and the SmackDown writing team turns its lonely eyes to John Brad Shaw Layfield to be the new top heel and Eddie's first challenger. Why Bradshaw? Um, it's actually... I, I was watching a show a little while ago, and it was, uh, I think it was like King of the Ring 2001 or something like that, and in it, Bradshaw cuts this like amazing pro-America promo and stuff like that, and he had done promos like that that were kind of scattered among all of his APA work where it didn't really matter if he could cut a promo or not, 
And I wonder if they hadn't always known he could do that and just never found a way for him to do it. So, well, like, if you can cut the promo, then that's something. But he had had to. I think he invented this character. I think he had to. Probably. And it's, like we've said, it's basically the real him. I mean, it's a played-up version of the version of him that appeared, who was appearing on Fox News and right. CNBC. I think he was still with CNBC and not Fox News at this point. I think CNBC fired him after he did uh, the goose step at the house show in Germany. But yeah, I think that was the big turning point, was when he got the deal to be on the cable news. And so... Yeah. He maybe had a book coming out, he had a radio show, and yeah, I think Vince looked at that and is like, well, this guy, this is you know a self-made man, this is a star. I don't know how much any of that actually translated to getting new eyes on the product, but it certainly created a character that had some money in it. Absolutely, and when he debuted, as a fun historical fact, I was actually at the SmackDown where the JBL character debuted. Um, He came out and did a promo, and it was a good, solid heel promo, and I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, Maybe he's going to feud with Cena, go after the US title, that would make sense with the character. And then the main event that night was Eddie Guerrero versus Booker T, which I had thought was going to be the Judgment Day main event, the heel on the roster. And JBL ran in and attacked Eddie Guerrero. And everybody kind of turned to look at each other and like, wait, they're going with JBL for the main event. And that still feels weird right now. And we'll kind of get into it too when we get to Booker T's match. But I also thought it was a really bad idea not to let JBL or not to let Booker T have that spot at least to start. Because I thought that he was hot coming in off the ball. Yeah, and they had a cool character where he was like, I'm too good good for SmackDown. I'm the only real star here. It would make total sense for him to be like, I'm going to win the title and then I'm going to refuse to defend it and take it to Raw or something. Like, yeah. Eddie being SmackDown's champion, he's standing up for SmackDown and its fans. Just feels like kind of a natural feud, and wouldn't have done a huge buy rate, but I think it would have been you know just good enough. Right, and I mean, it's another chance for somebody who never really got their shot in the main event to, like, that was the point of the brand split, right? Make more room for guys who we couldn't push when we should have, and give them main event spots. Like, that's Booker T all over. And Rob Van Dam all over. And they just don't. No. So, JBL shot by new SmackDown general manager, Kurt Angle, um, after he played a video of himself beating up some Mexicans who were trying to illegally cross the American border. They were Uh just pouring the cheap heat on JBL at this point. And it's so much fixated on Mexicans in general that it almost never gets to Eddie Guerrero. You know what I mean? Like, there are so many, there are a number of these promos where, like, he literally never mentions Eddie's name. He's just insulting the concept of Mexicans. Yeah, no. They, and it helped or didn't help, depending on that. I think they were doing a lot of shows in the Southwest. At- the designer, coincidentally, Eddie is a Mexican uh, champion, is going to help draw in those towns, and they have an you know anti-Mexican heel on top against him. It's natural heat. It's tasteless. I think it was offensive. I can understand how it would you know turn some people off from the product. I don't know. Don't have numbers to cite whether it actually did, but. Yell booed. There was a lot of heat on him almost immediately. Absolutely. And this is actually the start of every year after this, they're going to talk about how they need to fill the Eddie Guerrero role because Hispanic viewers start turning in in droves to see Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. I mean, it's a documented fact. Yeah. They're a huge part of SmackDown's audience is the Hispanic audience, and Raw's not getting that crossover. So obviously, they're coming for Eddie. Um, and so, obviously, like it, that somebody in the office decided, like, all right, let's just insult these people. We'll be heels to them. Makes sense. But I, it goes so hard, and it's so foul. Like, I'm not sure that they didn't really press this one too hard. And the racist wins in the end. Yes, definitively. <laughs> also a problem. Um, but you're right. They did continually try to do this, which is why they redid this exact same feud 10 years later with 
John Rio. Yeah, that's exactly right. Obviously, I mean, there, there are points where JBL in his promo lines they would like it. He talks about John Bradshaw Layfield's America in his promos. To be honest, it, it's uncomfortable how relevant this promos these promos were. You know what I mean? Like it's it's very uncomfortable how this is still a very like if JBL came out with this character today, it would only be more relevant than it was then. Actually, notably at this point, I mean, it, in some ways, John Bradshaw Layfield. There's elements of kind of George W. Bush there. Bush was running for re-election, but like George. Bush was a moderate on immigration and like wanted to have immigration reform and it always, you know, this spoke fluent Spanish and had a strong relationship with Mexico as the governor of Texas. Like a lot of ways, this is like a look into the future of the Republican party. I kept waiting for him to say the words, make America great again. Like that's what it is. Like that would, they would have slid so easily into this promo. There are, I've heard it never from reliable sources, but that, Donald Trump was inspired by like Zeb Coulter promos and oh was kind God. of stirred by that. And, you know, you can sort of see it. Um, but I've never heard that from what I would consider a reliable source. But Oh, God, that, that's a depressing thought for the day. I mean, it's kind of amazing here that, yeah, I mean, JBL is a look into the future of where American politics was going. Um, you know, there, there was clearly plenty of anti-immigration sentiment among the grassroots at that point, but I don't think at a more elite level we had seen it yet. Right. So the other big angle they did to build up JBL was they did a house show in El Paso at his hometown where he like brought his family into the ring, including his very old mother. She was well into her 70s, and JBL like, got in the ring and attacked Eddie and then like kind of cornered her and she collapsed and faked like she was having a heart attack, but it turns out she actually did have some sort of heart-related episode as a result of this. She worked herself into a shoot. <sighs> and, like, they show, like, very, very sparing footage of it on this show to kind of hype it. Like, that's one of those things where, like, what do you do if you're in JBL shoes? You're like, well... This thing that we were doing for Heat happened for real. I guess I got to take credit for it, but fuck, I hope I don't get lynched next time I'm in town. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, I, this is just a general piece of advice to wrestling promoters. Don't do heart attack angles. World Class did it with Fritz Von Erich. WCW did it with Ric Flair. It just freaks people out. It's not good heat. It doesn't, I mean, it just scares people. Let the record show that SmackDown would not learn this lesson and would do heart attack oh, angles with Al right. Wilson and Teddy Long. And, and that Teddy Wilson Long already again. happened at this point. I, I didn't bother to research this, but there's a Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie match on this show that I think was part of that program. I have no idea, and I did not want <laughs> to go know. back. And, yeah. I didn't want to Google that and find Al Wilson and his tidy whities again, so I didn't want to relive it. Like, it feels like during that match they should have mentioned, oh, yeah, you'll remember a few months ago, <laughs> Don Marie fucked Tori's father to death. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Cole, she did. You would think they would never stop mentioning that, ever or ever. You could never put these two names together again and be like, oh, hey, I guess they're going to have a batch. No, she fucked her father to death. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the best period for WWE creative is uh, sort of what I'm getting to, but it, I think it also demonstrates the point that I, of the reasons why WWE's popularity declined, I don't think you can say it's because they stopped doing like edgy mature angles because like, look at what we just talked about. People died. People had heart attack, them, political commentary. They were not shying away from controversy at this point. No, there's one thing that they shied away from, and we'll get to it later on in the show. But yeah, if anything, and if it feels so weird to say this, but Vince Russo did this more tastefully than the writers they had at this point were doing it. And you never think of Vince Russo. statement. I know, but at least he, he made it part of a universe where it made sense instead of just being like, hey, this is a wrestling show, and by the way, Mexicans are gross. So getting to the show itself, 
Judgment Day 2004. It was May 16th, 2004 from the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. They drew a sellout crowd of 18,722. Uh, the pay-per-view buy rate was not good, though. 235,000 buys, down from 315,000 for Judgment Day 2003, the year before, um, which was a main event of... I have Hogan versus... 2002, Judgment Day 2003 would have been, hmm, let's look this one up, oh, Kevin Nash versus Triple H, no, Brock Lesnar versus Big Show was the main event, but the other big match was Kevin Nash versus Triple H, Ugh. so, yeah, <laughs> to play, yeah, this show less than that. So 235,000 buys was a pretty terrible number for the time. It was down almost 100,000 buys from the Raw pay-per-view the month before Backlash 2004, which had uh, the WrestleMania rematch. That, that, was, a, that was a strong pay-per-view with an event and uh, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and also um, Cactus Jack back into Orton, but still, you know, we're seeing a big split between Raw and SmackDown here. Yeah, for sure. And and you can tell. You can just look at the stars on either show, and they give Raw the immediately after WrestleMania show. Like, it's never a mystery where their priority is at this point. No. This is where SmackDown becomes the B show. So uh, the dark match was Mark Jindrak versus Funaki. I'm surprised... <laughs> That wasn't on the show based on uh, some of what we have to come here. Yep. Uh, the opening package was kind of uncomfortable because it's all about death and the afterlife and judgment. And there's a bunch of, you know, obviously images of Eddie Guerrero, including one that plays right as it asks, is there life after death? I, I was in my living room and I looked over at my wife as that happened. I was like, no, come on, no. Mm -hmm. Eddie Guerrero is uh, dead just over a year after this. Uh, Whew. Yeah, uncomfortable in retrospect. So, opening match, we've got Rey Mysterio and Rob Van Dam against the Dudley Boys. Um, Van Dam had moved over from Raw, and he had come into conflict with the Dudley Boys because they had turned heel and joined up with Paul Heyman, and Heyman asked Van Dam to join up with him, and Van Dam declined. Now, at the time, I had this idea that I thought they should have Heyman have an ECW stable with Van Dam and the Dudleys and you know whoever else, and that they should push Van Dam into the main event. And I'll stand by that and say I think that would have been a lot better than JBL in the main event here. Oh, I think it definitely would have. And I think there's a lot to that because they still had a lot of people in WWE at that time who had ECW connections that you oh, could yeah. have done something with. Rhino, Tajiri. Yeah, a feud with Jericho, Benoit. Like, there's a lot of dudes you can bring in to feud with that stable, and it, you got something there. Yeah. Why Van Damme and Mysterio? They might. But Anna, that's possible. Mm hmm. Uh, um, or this this is not, not a smart show because you need Van Dam and Mysterio in separate matches. Those are two guys who can work good fifteen to twenty minute singles matches. And instead, if you're going to do this tag match, I feel like it needed to go about thirty minutes. And you probably could could about would ever have gotten sick of hot tags to either RVD or Mysterio. It must be said, uh, I think the crowd was so liquid hot on this from like basically start to finish that they clearly were not, didn't really give a shit if we got another 10 minutes of it. It didn't even really get going for the first eight or nine minutes. So yeah, I don't see why they didn't just give it 20 and just let it go. The crowd was hot for this whole show, despite the company's best attempts to kill them. Nah, and it's... It's actually kind of worrying, because of the things that we're going to see on this show, the fact that the crowd was hot through them kind of makes me wonder about this damn crowd. <laughs> um, so it's mostly just the stuff you'd expect. You know, the Dudleys work in heel for the first time in a while, do a lot of good heel you know, tag team spots. 
cutoffs, tags the referees don't see. They get heat on both guys. You know, we get hot tags, and both these guys are great at taking the hot tag and kind of running through their signature spots. The crowd knows. Um, there's a really awesome moonstall from Mysterio for a close two count, a hot tag. Um, a really awesome spot where Van Damme, um, like, alley-oops Mysterio up into a top rope Frankenstein or on Devon. That was that really was, cool. That thing was crazy. Like, and when you think about how if he had thrown him the wrong way, how we could have gone anywhere, like, it was as precise as possible. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, that was probably the highlight of the match. Mysterio hit the 619 on both does five-star frog splash on the win. Really good match. You know, fun 15 minutes, pop the crowd, but kind of meaningless. And also, this if they were going to do it, really probably should have been for the tag titles instead of the tag title match we had later in the show. Yeah, I do think they wind up winning the tag titles here pretty soon, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Like, again, this is just another... For some reason, Rob Van Dam main events a pay-per-view in 2001 during the invasion. I don't think he main events another one until One Night Stand 2006. And somehow in between, they just keep doing these random-ass tag teams just to kill time with him. Like, hey, Booker T likes weed. Let's put him with him. Hey, Kane is a guy. Let's put him with him. Yeah, it, so I think there was somebody in the back who didn't like him would be my best guess. Either Vince didn't buy into it or Triple H didn't like him, but somebody just didn't see Van Damme as a main event guy, which, you know, maybe under an ide ideal circumstances he wouldn't be, but, you know, SmackDown 2004 is far from ideal circumstances. Yeah, I think there are like four people on this entire show that aren't actively in the main event, whoever main evented anywhere. So, I mean, why are you wasting, Rob? That sounds about right. Uh, we go backstage to Josh Matthews looking just ridiculous in an open college <laughs> shirt. Uh, <laughs> hair with like frosted tips. <laughs> he he looks like seventeen years old here. Um, if you if you remember what Michael Cole looked like in the Attitude Era, it looks like his dorky son with the yeah, same look. Absolutely. Um, he's knocking on Booker T's locker room. Booker T comes out, shouts a promo about how tonight uh, the match against the Undertaker is the biggest match of his career. Uh, we go back to ringside where Kurt Angle comes out for a promo. He's got a lot of heat here. He's wheeled out to the ring in his wheelchair by Luther Reigns. So I will stop and explain. Um, like a week or two after he became the general manager, they did a thing where Big Show lost a match and Big Show walked backstage angry and saw Tori Wilson like laughing with a friend of hers. And Big Show thought she was laughing at him. So Big Show did a King Kong and like grabbed her and climbed up to the top of the arena with her. Uh, not the top of the arena, just like a high ledge somewhere backstage and was like holding her off, threatening to throw her off the ledge. And Angle went up to like try to save her and got choke slammed off the ledge by Big Show. This was to explain why he wasn't going to be wrestling for a few months while he was recovering from neck surgery. This also wrote Big Show off the show because he needed knee surgery. So Angle has a broken leg and is in a wheelchair. And I mean, that's sort of what I remember from this time is just Angle doing like his wheelchair gimmick in a lot of weird ways. Man, in order to compensate for this, Kurt Angle cuts a promo that is the most cheap heat I've ever heard in one promo before. That was like, only in a few though. Like that was all he did when he debuted. That is true, but like it's like five weeks worth of cheap heat packed into one promo. He was just like, Los Angeles sucks. The name Los Angeles sucks. The city of angels sucks. The Lakers suck. You guys all suck. You're At ugly. not a rapist like Kobe Bryant. Oh my God. The heat he got with that line was brilliant though. <laughs> yeah. I'll also note as a Michigan homer that this is just a few weeks before the Detroit Pistons kicked the Lakers ass in the finals. Very good. Very good. <laughs> He says to wrap it up that he hopes there's a big earthquake that destroys LA. And I mean, it's just unbelievable. 
Yeah, then he says that Tori Wilson is the reason he's in the wheelchair. He orders Tori to come out. Um, literally, they cut to the big screen, and the beginning of Tori Wilson's video is her bending over and pulling her pants down. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Just another times have changed moment. Comes out in what could loosely be called wrestling gear. And... Sort of. And then... Yeah. Angle says that if she loses this next match to Dawn Marie, she's fired. So this, we don't remember if this, if the Al Wilson thing has happened yet, but that is a thing that happened at some point, that Dawn Marie married Tori Wilson's father and had sex with him until he had a heart attack and died. She but, also tried to um, blackmail Tori into having a lesbian relationship with her. I believe those events are reversed, where she was in love with Tori and yeah. wanted her, and Tori said no, so she fucked her dad to death. <laughs> yep. I can't say that sentence enough. Fucked her dad <laughs> to death. Yeah, I think this, episode, this episode's getting a mature rating, just like this show <laughs> has on the now. Holy shit. That is something that, like, I was stunned when that came, when you turn the show on, it's one probably the ECW shows have mature ratings too, but then I quickly remembered why uh, when I remembered what happened in the main event. But Dom Marie comes out in, and they have a really terrible match. And like I want to point out, like when people talk about wrestling from like women's wrestling from this era, it's bad. But the reason that it's bad isn't because the girls aren't trying; it's because the girls have no idea what the fuck they're doing. And that's not their fault. They've been taught how to do moves. And so when they're doing moves, for the most part, the moves look fine, but they have no idea where they are in the ring when they're doing them. They have no idea what order or sequence they should be doing them in. They have no idea what comes next until the ref tells them. It's just, it's a mess, and it's an easily preventable mess just by having someone put them in the ring like once a week. Like, I don't understand what the appeal of this was supposed to be. <laughs> Well, we'll get to it in a second. Uh, Tori Wilson is actually pretty athletic, was my note here. She pulls off a few decent moves. She, a head scissor, a couple other things. Don Marie couldn't do anything. Right. I mean, Don Marie was just a manager. I'm not sure when they decided that she should suddenly start wrestling all of a sudden. Uh, this match goes six minutes for some reason. They probably had about two minutes worth of material. And then we get to the high spot of the match where Don Marie's pants fall down. I wish I knew for certain if that was intentional or not. Because Don Marie doesn't was. sell it like it's in, yeah. Don Marie doesn't sell it like it's intentional though. She doesn't sell it like she's embarrassed or anything. She just keeps going. Yeah, um, the announcers like don't shy away from it, and the camera doesn't either. But this is also still the trash era. So I mean, today if one of the girls had this happen to them, they'd you know shoot around it. Nobody would mention it. But yeah, here they just you know steer right into the skid. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's sure what they do. Um, I mean, look, these are both lovely women to look at. Uh, they've both clearly tried. I mean, Tori Wilson's really trying with her face and everything to convey this storyline that she's weirdly a part of. It, it, it's just a failure as a segment, and they can't have thought they were succeeding with anything here. No, and it's just like, it's not on the performers. It's on the people who are putting them in this position. Right. They were women in this company who could actually wrestle. They had Trish Stratus, they had Lita, they had Victoria, they had Molly Holly, but the SmackDown... Hey, one of them wrestles a match later on this show. <laughs> yeah, the SmackDown women's division and the Ridge women's division in this era. Absolutely. And Tori wins the match with a backslide. Not that anybody cares. <laughs> she keeps, she her, keeps, job, she keeps right? her job. Yeah. Omo, where he complains that this is a country full of Eddie Guerreros. He says he doesn't mind the ones that wash his car and shine his shoes and sell fruit along the highway, but in John Bradshaw Layfield's America, everyone speaks on English. Uh, people on welfare don't have tons of kids. Criminals like Eddie Guerrero get prosecuted. I actually didn't think this was that great of a promo just because his delivery here was very wooden. It sounded like he was reading this off of a television prompter 
Yeah, I think this was meant to ape like those campaign ads, but he's not really running for anything, so I'm not really sure why he's doing it that way. I mean, it I is talking directly to the camera here. It would have actually been fun if they had done like campaign commercials with him. That wouldn't have been a bad idea. Also, because this was like the first presidential election after they put in the law where people had to say, "And I approve this message" at the end of their ads. Yeah, that would have been pretty good. That would have been some good heat. So anyway, the next match, Mordecai versus Scotty. T- oh, Ohio. I can't wait to talk about that this, buddy. <laughs> Why does Mordecai look like Will character from Zoolander? I, I will always wonder what the fuck the costume designer for Mordecai was thinking. Like, I know that wrestling fashion isn't necessarily something everyone gives a shit about, but let's go through this, all right? He's got totally white hair. His yep. eyebrows are dyed white. He's wearing a sleeveless shirt with his emblem on it that's see-through. And he's wearing those, like, he's wearing those pants that wrestlers wore in the 80s where you could see, like, the under tights under the pants. <laughs> So it looked like like two layers of pants. Yeah. He Everything about like, this was very 1980s. Yeah. I wrote in my notes, like, this is, looks like someone walked straight out of 1988. And this match is also like a squash match from WWF Superstars circa 1988. Yeah, except that for some reason in the middle of the match, she decides to start selling for Scotty for like two minutes. <laughs> Like, what the hell kind of squash match is this for the supernatural guy selling super kicks for Scotty Too Hotty? So he comes down to the ring in his big white robe with a big white staff. He walks through fire. It's a cool entrance. You know, it's a, maybe a little too cartoonish for 2004, but it's clear that this is The Undertaker's next big opponent, right? Oh, yeah. Like, it, it couldn't scream that more. It's the light against the dark. You know, this is what they want. The problem is... Well, there's a couple problems, but one of them is he gets in the ring and they're building up, oh, this guy's so big, look at him. And Scotty. Oh, yeah, he's 6'4". I mean, and it's the same problem when they make him fake Kane later on. Like, he's not... He wasn't, fa- he wasn't fake Kane. That was... Um, oh, that was... Uh, oh, yeah, that was Festus. That was Festus. That's right. Kane, My bad the thing is, Kane is also, like, 6'4". We had to put up with years of pretending Kane is 7 <laughs> feet tall. Kane is barely tall. Two. Come on, Kane now. is barely taller than The Rock. Like, <laughs> come on. Even with the lifts in his shoes. That is true. That is true. My but biggest anyway. pro- yeah, my biggest problem with Mordecai is that we're on a show where nothing is out of bounds, right? Like, let's men can fight women, and we can make fun of Mexicans, and we can make gay jokes, and we can do literally everything. Is absolutely supposed to be like an evangelical Christian yeah, supernatural film. They never mention God. They never mention the word religion or Christian yeah. or any of that. It's just like he doesn't with, have a re- just like with brother love. You can't mention the Bible. You can't mention God. Right. I mean, he doesn't even have, he doesn't have a real cross. It's like a, a little fake design cross, which is obviously meant to evoke the cross. They were saving, they were saving God for that hot program with Vince in 2006. But see, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what stopped this character from even having the potential to be anything. It's just tiptoeing around what the character even was. And so he's got all these, like, sort of on-the-nose, lame Christian things, but they're not Christian, so they just look anything. No, it's more Harry it, Potter it, than than biblical. Yeah, and they're doing like monk shit that has nothing to do with Christianity. Like it's like they had no. If they had just made him like, if they had had like Brother Love come out and manage Mordecai, the Christian warrior, the demon Undertaker, that's something. It's not something I want to see, but it's something. No. Mordecai is intense, but like cartoonishly so, I would say. And he's stiff, and I don't mean that in the sense that like he's hitting Scotty really hard. I mean in like he has no flexibility and he's like trying to stand ramrod straight up as he does everything. Like he wrestles like the Undertaker did in not when he was first coming in, and it's just not a style that I think works well in two thousand and four, especially for oh, a guy who's just kind of normal sized. 
Yeah. Let the record, it, 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 this is what it would look like if somebody who really sucks tried to do the Undertaker gimmick. Fuck. Because they're not Mark Calloway. Yeah, so this should be a pure squash. It's only three minutes long, but Scott and start to do the worm at one point. What is, yeah, like, what are they doing with this squash? Why does Scotty have to get his cheap spot in years after anybody likes him? That's a great question. Like, literally, like, not only is he selling for Scotty, but, like, he's on the ground. Like, you want to build up somebody for The Undertaker and Scotty Too Hotty puts him down? Are you serious? How long do you think it was until The Undertaker got knocked off his feet on television in his initial run? It may have been half a decade before that really happened. No, wait, it was whenever he ran up against Hogan, I bet yeah. you. <laughs> Which was a year after his debut. But still, that's and different. Than if, like, first night. Yeah, I mean, if you face The Undertaker, he knocks you off your feet. That's one thing. Scotty Too Hotty performs the worm on you. Yeah. When The that's Undertaker a whole other wrestled thing. jobbers in 1991, he was not selling for them. Hell no. Um, so this character lasted about a month longer. He wrestled Hardcore Holly at the Great American Bash 2004. And at that point, I think they just saw that this wasn't working and pulled the plug, sent Kevin Thorne back to developmental, and he would return as the ECW vampire in 2006. A, what a cursed career that man had. I, I didn't think the vampire was... But, I mean, this is just another in a long line of, you know, th- at least this and feuding with The Undertaker, so it goes down alongside Hague Vanson instead of you know, Giant Gonzalez and some of the terrible characters who actually got a run against Undertaker. Yeah. This one, of all of the weird OVW call-ups during this period, this one's the most fascinating to me, because it seems like this one's the most ambitious, but also the one they half-assed the most. So... <laughs> I don't know how this ever could have worked, but they had to... I bet you they knew before he ever debuted, like, nope, this isn't happening. Fuck it. Nope. They were just throwing shit at the wall. Speaking Absolutely. of shit, we go back to Chavo and Chavo Classics locker room. Jacqueline, the cruiserweight champion and Chavo's opponent tonight, comes in and gives Chavo the gift of a pink bra and panties. And in the background, we see Chavo Classic, like, measuring them against himself to see if they'll fit. Yep, that is factual. That That's what happened. And shockingly, as a spoiler, this doesn't lead to a segment in the match where Chavo Classic gets his to see that he's wearing the bra and panties. That is pretty shocking, because that um, almost would, that would have been, like, the closest to a redeeming element in any of this. Yeah, that would have gotten a big... Um, We'll go into Jacqueline as Cruiserweight Champion when we get to that match in a little bit. First up, we have the WWE Tag Team Championship. (sighs) Marley Haas, the defending champions against the illustrious tag team of Hardcore Holly and Billy Gunn. Okay, so it's an odd couple tag team. Rico... He has a hot girlfriend, and Charlie Haas is super manly and isn't into that stuff. See, I, I could never decide, like, they were doing this kind of weird poly thing where, like, Rico and Tori were kind of together, and Charlie and Tori were kind of together, and, like, Rico was kind of Tori's gay best friend, but he wasn't really gay, but was he? <laughs> Because they would never definitively say that somebody was on television, though he was playing the most offensive gay stereotype I have ever seen on television. Not on wrestling. Not in re- in real life, even. I've never seen anything to this degree. He is so stereotypically flamboyantly gay here. The crowd does pop really big for like his gay antics, though, so that's something. Yeah, and they're, so they're doing this thing. They have a catwalk set up. So, <laughs> so Tori and Rico walk the catwalk together, and Charlie won't because he's just too straight, gosh darn it. Oh, he can't walk so, over the catwalk. He's so straight. He would never do something like that. 
Oh my god! And then my favorite part was though when Hardcore Holly and Billy Gunn come out, the catwalk's still up, and Hardcore Holly's like, "I don't give a shit," and he walks the catwalk. <laughs> yeah, Hardcore Holly ain't scared of shit. What people do in their own personal <laughs> life is their business. Like Hardcore Holly's the most tolerant man in this match, and that is amazing. <laughs> See, okay, there's a couple things with Billy Gunn here I think are ridiculous. One is, his old gimmick was Mr. Ass, the guy who would moon people and loved his ass and was, again, kind of a gay character. And also, Rico used to manage him with Billy and Chuck. Where they're yes, gay men, where they were, that they were obviously... Let, let's just... Let's just be nice and say that they were intentionally pretending to be gay. Yeah, it was just a publicity stunt. But there's no mention of the fact that Charlie Ha or that Billy Gunn used to be managed by Rico. That doesn't come up in this match. Instead, it's just like the two straight dudes are freaked out by Rico's gay antics. Yes. The entire premise of Charlie Haas and Rico as tag team champions was Rico is a gay man who is free and happy, and Charlie Haas has to learn to come to terms with it. Except that never happens. <laughs> no, no. I, th I think they lost interest in this tag team not too long after this. Um, I, I guarantee you, if you ask the writers at this point in time, I promise you they thought that Rico was a positive gay role model. I promise you. Like, he's winning. I think it's, it's all good. Promotions always talk themselves into that. Like, look, I, I don't turn on WWE expecting to see positive gay stereotypes, but stereotypes of wrestlers. I don't turn it on expecting to see bisexual people catered to, trans people catered to. But what I do expect is that you not, at least when you see a negative gay stereotype, you'd be like, hey, we're presenting a negative gay stereotype. Maybe we should shut the fuck up. Yeah, uh, there's just a lack of self awareness here. Um, Rico was actually a good wrestler though which i think yeah. is kind of the tragedy of the fact that he got stuck with this character and it's funny because he was also like a real life badass too yeah wasn't he actually like a martial arts guy yeah he was like martial artist and he was like a cop and like there's this great story of like him being on a plane and somebody starting like starting fights and him like taking them down like he was like real life badass yeah um, so the match goes for a while. Holly hits the Alabama slam on Haas or goes for it. Rico kicks him. Haas rolls him up. One, two, three. And there's. Yep. <laughs> yeah, not good. Uh, this show has fallen off a lot after the opener and it's not going to get any better for a while. I would also just like to say like, Imagine you're Charlie Haas and you turn on Raw every week and you see what they're doing with Shelton and then you come to the arena and you're tag teamed up with Rico and Tori and you're yeah, like... Shelton just beat Triple H. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, good. <laughs> oh, great. This is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Marty. Great. <laughs> got the short end of that, although he deserved it. He could have been a fine, just like... He would have right. been okay in that role. Uh Next, we get an Undertaker and Paul Bear promo. It's just the usual, but it's fun to see Paul Bear back on TV. He had been gone uh, for several years before he came back at WrestleMania. It's very, like, just very throwback to the original Undertaker. They're standing in, you know, a smoky backdrop room. You know, Paul Bear's going, oh, yes. You know, it's very 19, early 1990s, which I feel like was the tone of a lot of what they were doing on this show at this point. Yeah, pretty much. For some reason, yeah, it all has a little bit of a throwback feel to it. Yeah. Uh, matches for the Cruiserweight Championship of the world, I guess. Uh, Jacqueline, <laughs> the Cruiserweight Champion of the world versus Chavo Guerrero. Uh what are your feelings on intergender matches? I'm 100% open and happy for intergender matches. I think that it's something that's healthy and good when presented in a proper way. Um, I don't really see, like, especially when it comes to, like, certain things. Like, people who argue against intergender wrestling obviously aren't thinking of when, like, Awesome Kong wrestles Eric Young, right? <laughs> like, that's obviously not what they're thinking of. They're thinking about like Kelly Kelly versus the big show. But I think there are absolutely spots when it's healthy and good and should be supported. This isn't one of those. 
No, this sucks. Um, Jacqueline, I like Jacqueline. She had a really good run in WCW, which didn't last very long, where she was managing Kevin Sullivan. And she would just beat the shit out of dudes. Like, she'd body slam them, clothesline them. The crowd would pop huge for that. Uh, that was when she was younger than this and, like, bodybuilding and in really good shape, whereas here she's just really tiny. Like, she's kind of 5'2", not a wrestler and i just think this killed the cruiserweight division not that it was terribly strong but at no way out chavo and mysterio had had a really good match for this belt and i think this was the beginning of this belt becoming a joke yeah i mean bless chavo for going with this and selling for jackie and making it doing his best to make something out of the garbage he was handed which is really what chavo did with this division the whole time like, he's the only person who ever made this division look like something worth having around. And every time they moved him away from it, it would go straight in the shitter again. Yeah, so the match, Chavo has to wrestle with an arm tied behind his back. Um, he mostly beats up Jacqueline. She gets in some offense, so Chavo Classic helps his son out of the arm tie. Chavo beats up Jacqueline with both his arms. Uh, Chavo hits a gory bomb and wins. This match sucked, um, but the worst was yet to come because on the next SmackDown, they did a triple threat where it was uh, Jacqueline versus Chavo versus Chavo Classic, and Chavo Classic won the Cruiserweight title. Yep, that sure did happen. <laughs> and hey, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Chavo Classic. Was it Chavo Classic or was it Hornswoggle? All right. I think it was Hornswoggle because the crowds like Chavo Classic. There was something he was there. Really, he was really entertaining. Oh my god, yeah. And hey, he was at least at one point a cruiserweight. Like he invented the fucking moonsault. I mean, there's something there. Yeah, I mean, he's a Guerrero. They're all good. P.S. He didn't actually invent the moonsault. He just tells people he did. Nobody else. Nobody else who's still who is still around to argue with him about that. Yeah, exactly. So next matchup. Uh, is the United States Championship, John Cena defending against Rene Dupree. Um, Dupree was drafted to SmackDown out of the La Resistance tag team, and he's an arrogant Frenchman, which is you know the most typical character you can think of. Uh, and he's feuding with the U.S. Champion, which is a very natural feud. A um, lot of cheap heat in a French character. Dupree certainly has some potential, but... He is 20, which is shocking. Yeah, it's actually a, a real shame that he lived in this era where they just desperately needed people. So like I said, they were throwing stuff at a wall. If NXT had existed then, really gotten the time to develop because he had potential. Like his promos were amazingly good for like a 19-year-old. Uh, his wrestling wasn't great, but the building blocks were there. He had a great look. Like there's something here. Get a chance yeah, to develop. They just kind of threw him to the wolves. I mean, yeah, it's he, he does okay for himself, but he's so young. It's the same it's the same thing as Alex Wright and WCW, where they just throw him ahead and kind of let him die in front of everybody. It's actually very um, similar because the most over thing about both guys with the little dance that they did. <laughs> yeah. Um so what was bigger here, the pop that John Cena got coming out or the erection that Rene Dupree had during this match? <laughs> this is one of the most legendary erections in wrestling history. <laughs> oh. Look, man. I, I, <laughs> I mean, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, those, those trunks were very flattering. <laughs> Good for Mrs. Dupree, as they say. <laughs> Did he? Did this happen to him all the time? I don't remember it happening frequently. I really don't. But he got... I think it was just this one match that stuck him with that reputation. But it was like... I remember going on the internet and it being like, Boner watch Rene Dupree match. <laughs> um, you know, this happens to some guys. It's just, uh, you know... It, physiological a reaction there. there's a lot of like you know no, you're, you're like, just in little trunks and sometimes it's kind of cold and then you're you know brush wrestling in the ring wrestling a lot of guy a lot, lot know, of adrenaline a lot of baby oil you know <laughs> cheering crowd you're in front of a lot of people yeah 
Look, man, um, you get excited. Nobody likes to be called up to the chalkboard to solve a problem when they have this going on. He worked through it. <laughs> it's only, you know, he's just removed from being a teenager. Still a lot of hormones running through that system. Very true. So, like I said, Cena gets a ridiculous pop here. The, the Doctor of Thugonomics character was so beloved. And as soon as they move him to Raw the year after this, they drop this character. Yep. Why did they do that? Um, I don't know if Vince saw Hulk Hogan in him. I mean, I know, like, based on the push that he would eventually get, somebody says, let's push him like we pushed Hulk, and that's what they would proceed to do. But I don't... Obviously, this character doesn't fit that image of, like, the squeaky clean baby face that maybe Vince wanted at the time, but it's hard to say because they go away from this character. They only even really reference it like two or three more times ever after they go away from it. Yeah, no. Doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. Um, Sample line from his rap. It looks like Fifi took a PP on top of his head. Also, he was a really bad rapper. Have we? Can we just establish that for a second? Like, he is a legendarily shit rhymer of words. I think he is like he's a person who doesn't know anything about rap's idea of what a good rapper would sound like. Yeah, I mean, he he originally got this gimmick. Because he and Rikishi used to do freestyles in the back of the bus on road trips. Which is kind of a fantastic way to get a gimmick, first of all. And second of all, like the idea that he out-battle raps Rikishi is not like a ringing endorsement to me. No, you weren't impressed with Rikishi's classic single, Bad Man? I'm a bad man, giving bad men bad looks. Prince amongst thieves and crooks. Sweet. Um, <laughs> so they brawl uh, they botch a clothesline where Dupree doesn't go over the top rope and it looked like his head almost came off his shoulders yeah it did uh, Dupree takes over with some wrestling school offense, locks in a really long bear hug um, Cena makes a comeback, he misses the five knuckle shuffle, uh, Dupree breaks out his French tickler dance which gets a huge pop Oh, that thing was legendary. Um, there's a couple pinfall reversals. Uh, Dupree goes for a leapfrog. Cena catches him, hits the FU, and pins him. As much as we joked about it, this wasn't a bad match. It was just kind of a basic wrestling match between two pretty over characters. Yeah. I mean, on a good show, this is the kind of match that you would want to have be for like the Intercontinental title or the U.S. title, right? Like two youngsters who might become something big one day wrestling over a secondary title, getting some good time. Like, there's nothing wrong with this. No, but on this show, it's, like, the third best match. Yeah. Which is a real problem. Um, so, next up, we get a Kenzo Suzuki uh, video package. You remember this, Jay Brown? I remember him because I was watching him in Japanese wrestling before this ever happened. So I remember seeing his face show up and being like, one of the most legendary things in Johnny Ace's entire extended career as the guy in charge of talent and development and all of that stuff was he hired the wrong Japanese guy. There was a tag team in Japan at the time that was doing pretty good featuring Kenzo Suzuki and Hiroshi Tanahashi, oh my and God. James Laurinaitis thought that Kenzo Suzuki was the money. <laughs> okay, I thought you literally meant like with like he hired the wrong one-legged wrestler. Like he meant to hire Kenzuki Suzuki, and he accidentally hired Kenzo Suzuki. No, no, this tag team, and he decided that the better member of it <laughs> was Kenzo Suzuki. <laughs> so, I didn't know anything about Japanese wrestling at this time. The only thing I knew about Japanese wrestling was like what I read on internet message boards, which is Japanese wrestling is awesome. So when they signed this guy, I assumed, oh man, this guy's got to be a stud. He's got to be oh, awesome boy. if they're bringing him in. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> and he just completely sucked. 
What you didn't know was that the second he got signed, every Japanese wrestling fan was laughing their goddamn ass off because they hired literally probably the shittiest Japanese wrestler to come out of the JoJo in 20 years. Later on, when he goes back to Japan, he'll actually wind up getting over pretty good as a guy who sucks, knows he sucks, and plays it for jokes. Oh, my God. WWE wanted to make him a main inventor. More notable, I think, than his actual run is for him, of which one video package actually did air. I sent you this link. Did you get a chance to watch it? Oh, I watched it. You remember? Emperor the- Hirohito. Jesus Christ. Like, so it was a cool video package, like using imagery of World War II and the atomic bomb and a narrator talking about... Um, the emp- you know, the the empire of the land of the rising sun and how one member left of the Japanese dynasty. Except it turns out, unknown to anyone in WWE, the Japanese royal family is a real thing. They're real people and still alive. Yeah, go figure WWE not fact checking that one. <laughs> I mean, in their defense, I didn't know there was a Japanese royal family either, but I was in high school. Let's say Wikipedia oh, existed dude. at the time, I'm pretty sure, or some facsimile. Not a you know, billion company. <laughs> so, yeah, they actually put this on TV, and then I think it's going to cause some problems that uh, we're portraying this guy as a member of the Japanese royal family when that's a real thing, and this is probably not going to go over too well in Japan, which was a market they were looking to expand into at the time. Also, so, but just just imagine that that's the problem, right? It wasn't the character they came up with, which is that a Japanese guy would come in carried to the ring on a, a giant like contraption by a bunch of other Japanese guys, and he would be super racist stereotype. That's not the problem. It's that we offended some actual Japanese people. Yes. Um, this is also around the same time that they brought in John, and one proposal for him would be that he would be an unfrozen Nazi. Managed yep. by Paul <laughs> <laughs> And the story goes that the writer who proposed this actually got up in the meeting and started goose-stepping. Oh, my God. <laughs> chanting, hi, Dan Reich. Hi, Dan Reich. And Vince got up without a word and walked out of the meeting. But they went with every element of that character except the word Nazi. Yeah, no, Nazi was a bridge too far, except when they employed Ludwig Borga. But by 2004, you were not going to have a Nazi character, only if they were a shoot Nazi like Ludwig Borga. Oh my god, man. Like, what the fuck was going on at this time? Like, I always think back to it and think like, oh, this was a pretty normal time in wrestling. I mean, it was down business-wise, but I went back and watched the show and just had my mouth, like, wide open, gaping. Like, what the fuck is happening? (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, So we come back from that video package and Cena is still in the ring celebrating because they're just desperately stretching uh, to get this show to two and a half hours. Um, He goes into the crowd, gives his James Worthy jersey to a guy with a John Cena shirt. This just goes on for another several minutes. They're, again, just trying to kill time here. And then the announcers hype up, you know, how honored we should be that we're going to have a rare appearance of The Undertaker tonight. Which makes me think that they never intended to have The Undertaker on this show. I I do wonder if they intended to go further with Booker T, and it's just like the total lack of depth forced them to put The Undertaker, which forced them to take their hottest heel in Booker T and put him with The Undertaker. I wonder if all of these things just kind of lined up to make JBL happen. I can see that, because when I kind of rebook this card in my head, I can't figure out who to have face Undertaker. And you got to put him on the show, because he's your biggest star. By I mean, Eddie was hot here, but the Undertaker's the Undertaker, and he's just come back with the dead man gimmick. What 
you just need a classic monster for him, but they didn't have one that I can think of. They should have just fed Mordecai to him off the debut. <laughs> yeah, could have just done that. I don't think anybody would have complained too much. Um, but so the storyline here was just that, like we said, Booker was complaining that he was too good for SmackDown. So Undertaker challenged him to a match. This is the era where rather than show up to challenge people, the lights would just go out and Undertaker's disembodied voice would say, You, me, Judgment Day. Which is pretty great because he could just like phone that in from Texas and not even have to show up. <laughs> Literally phone it in. Um, so rather than portray this as Booker is a serious professional wrestler in the fight of his life and training really hard for this upcoming fight, they did a series of skits where Booker went to see Miss Cleo, who told him to go to a graveyard in Darkest Night and dig up some dirt from an unmarked grave to fight The Undertaker. Puts it in this like weird little baggie that would be like, it's probably like his weed bag he just got out of his car when they told him about this. <laughs> He's carrying it in front of him like it's a big deal, and it's literally just like a tiny little black bag yeah. that he's just swinging around. Oh, I, to me, there's this curse of being good at comedy, which is in WWE, if you're funny, that's all they'll ever let you do, and this is what happened to Booker T. Like... Oh, absolutely. Supermarket with Austin, this, uh, the gold dust stuff. A lot of that was really funny, but I think it's also a big part of the reason why he never became as big a star as he should have in WWE. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that. And I mean, it happened to him when he first came in and he, they put him with The Rock to cut promos and he was a funny buffoon and oh, he God, sort of never got his heat. Buried him. He never really gets his heat back after that. And somehow he's going to be so funny and good that he wound up making King Booker work. That, is, that was a remarkable feat. Yeah, that's a legendary accomplishment and talent right there. But shame, because there were times where like a legitimate athlete Booker T could have worked as a main eventer. This is one of them coming in with his like all-star mercenary, I'm better than everyone on this show. Uh, it could have worked uh, earlier on when he first came in. It's just like he's in, coming in hot. He's had like two months where they're kind of like heating him up, and then the Undertaker beats him here, and then he's dead. Stops him cold. again. It's just, and of course, Taker beats him. It's the Undertaker. It's just one of those where the mistake is not what happens in the match. The mistake is making the match in the first place. Yeah, and I mean, it kills Booker because there's nothing even interesting about this match. The Undertaker beats him in exactly the way you would think. His competition. Yeah. Booker, I mean, this is like, Taker's just come back, so he's going to be really strong. He doesn't sell shit here. Yeah, and he, he makes Booker look ridiculous, which isn't a huge surprise, but it's a drag. He even no-sells the dirt to the eyes. Like, he, throw, he gets the dirt thrown in his eyes, and he just rolls his eyes back in his head, and he's fine. I would have loved it so much if Booker had just taken that bag and thrown it at Undertaker, and like if it touches him, he can't move, so he's paralyzed, and he just lays it on him, and then the bag pins him for a three count. Yeah, um, so Booker hits the scissors kick, two count, Taker sits up, chokeslam, tombstone, one, two, three. Just, yeah, not, not the best presentation of Booker T here, and a real misstep, given that he was the only established heel that they had on the roster at this point. Yeah, I, I don't. There are a lot of things that you could hold against SmackDown in this era, obviously, like the actual planning and thought that went into it. The most egregious is the way that they waste the potential of people who this era was supposed to be for. Booker is just a highlight example. By the time he'll get to King Booker, he'll be too old to run with it for as long as he should have. Absolutely. Yeah, real missed opportunity with him here. Um, so it's main event time. Eddie Guerrero defending the WWE Championship against John Bradshaw Layfield. Um, uh, JBL doesn't have the limo entrance yet, unfortunately, but he comes out, gets a lot of heat, cuts a much better promo this time, uh, says he's doing this one in English, so ask an American to translate. 
uh, it talks about how these people in the crowd all swam and climbed fences to get to America, rips on Mexico, says he fired his Mexican housekeeper for stealing from him. <laughs> but that's okay. He's going to hire Eddie Guerrero's mother as his new maid after this match. Like, really going too far with this promo, but I kind of loved it. I mean, if you're going to go here, like, this is what you need to do. And it works. And, I mean, the crowd is... The crowd wants him dead in, like, the best possible way. So it's clearly working to some degree. Yeah. Eddie comes out to a ridiculous pop. I mean, he was legitimately the most over person in the company at this point. Is that fair to say? Like, not not even close. Definitely. And, like, it's one of those rare things where someone's so beloved that, like, years and years and years after they're gone, people still care. You know what I mean? I still see people in Eddie Guerrero shirts everywhere I go to wrestling events. Like, Eddie at this period is, like, touching people so deeply that it's it's hard to compare to anything, like, that we have in the present. Like, if anything, yeah, it's, like, literally it's, the opposite of Roman Reigns. <laughs> and a cross-section of fans because it's both – the hard, you know, the hardcore fan, but also the casual fan, and drawing in Hispanic fans who, you know, maybe they had family members who watched wrestling, and now they turn on their TV, and they have, you know, he's not Mexican, but he's Mexican American, and from a legendary Mexican wrestling family, and he is, you know, presented authentically as the champion of the world. Yeah, and he's proud of being Mexican, yeah. but he's also exactly. like, uh, hey, all Mexicans are, you know, cheating and stealing, ha, ha, ha. Like, well, literally, you know. it works. Yeah. Yeah, he gets the supremely racist lie, cheat, and steal gimmick over. Yeah, it's, he sure does. And, like, to the point where, like, Mexican fans are embracing it. Like, hey, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we're a bunch of criminals. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... I mean, the tragedy here with Eddie is he's finally kind of got his life straight. He's finally cleaned up. He's got the push. And unfortunately, he's really just, he's destroyed his body with what he's put himself through. But, you know, he's going to have a great match here or die trying. And he damn near dies trying. Yeah, if you don't know what match we're about to talk about, uh, this is what like Smarks called the Muda scale match, which refers to <laughs> ages and ages ago where Kaiji Muda or Great Muda at the time uh, had a match where he bladed so much that it was act like people in the audience actually threw up watching it. It was that bad. Uh, this is the closest to that I've ever seen. <laughs> like there, it is hard to enjoy this match and it's even harder knowing what's coming. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, just to get to the part of the match that really matters, they have a perfectly good match for about 10 minutes, and then the referee gets knocked, goes for a power bomb. Eddie backdrops JBL to the floor. JBL gets a chair and hits a despicable chair shot on Eddie, just, like, fucking dents this chair on his head. Um. I'll give JBL the benefit of the doubt here and say I bet uh, that Eddie may well have told him, like, fucking smack me with that thing because we've got to save this show. But it's a gross chair shot to the head. Yeah. Based on the blade job that Eddie does, like, he had to have said, you got to send it because I'm going to blade this thing like you just busted the top half of my head off. And the way this happened, everything comes together here to make this just a surreal moment. You have the gross chair shot. The camera lingers on JBL for a couple seconds to give Eddie time to blade. The announcers are silent because either something's gotten unplugged or they moved out of the way because they were fighting by the announce table. There's no commentary. Just the camera panning over to Eddie Guerrero and blood literally squirting out of his head and the crowd just goes, oh, like it's that special O oh moment, like when somebody, like if you were in the cafeteria and somebody had screamed out that like the teacher was a fucking prick, like everybody goes like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like just, holy shit, something bad has happened. Just I, everybody, I I think everybody's seen this, but I just you can't even describe how much blood this is, like. When he rolls over and his head is on the floor for five seconds, there is literally a puddle of blood where his head was. 
by the time this match is over, blood is on everything. I'm talking about like the ring posts, the the fucking ropes. Every inch of the mat is like stained like a dull maroon. Like it is that I've never seen anything like this outside of that one Muna match, which I wish I had never seen. But like this is unreal. I think JBL like I know people who... too, but it may have just been Eddie's blood that got on him. Yeah. I mean this is one of the, this is worse than any Ric Flair blade job. This is worse than any of that stuff. The like only, Eddie <laughs> The only one in WWE I can think of that comes close is the one Vince did about six months before this in the buried alive match against Undertaker. Right. And I mean Vince has months to heal after that happens. Yeah. Eddie's on the road is... the next day. And they continue to wrestle for like another fifteen to twenty minutes after this. Yeah, like this is almost like Puerto Rican style, where it's just like they get the blood, they get the blood going halfway through, and then it's literally dry by the time the match ends. I, it's just a surreal amount of blood coming out of his head. Um, they go back in the ring. JBL hits the clothesline from hell, and you kind of buy that this is going to be the pin, but it's just a super close two count. Uh, he goes for another clothesline from hell. He misses and takes out the referee. Uh, JBL goes for a powerbomb, and he hits it. The second referee wakes up, and it's a really close two count. I am really impressed in retrospect at how well they made it seem like JBL was going to win here. Oh, 100%. And like to the point where when he would eventually win, people were surprised. Because people thought this was when he would have won if he was going to do it. And man, those two near falls were close. Because Eddie, with all of this blood, and he's selling it, like he probably is legitimately woozy at this point because he would say later that he like almost lost consciousness like three times after that blade job. I shocked. He did it. The fact that he doesn't get any medical attention during this match is just shockingly irresponsible. Like he could have bled out and died here. Yeah. There are people who say that this contributed to his eventual death. Like it probably wasn't directly the result of this, obviously, but it didn't help the stress on his heart. I I I mean, that doesn't sound ridiculous to me. Um, it just, I, today, I think WWE is a little too far with the blood where, like, a guy gets a little nick and they have to stop the match to try to, you know, pat it down. But, like, this match should have been stopped. If this was a real boxing match or mixed martial arts fight and somebody bled like this, they would 100% stop the match. And honestly, maybe the whole thing works better if, like, they do stop the match and, like, JBL has his arm raised over a bloody destroyed Eddie. Like, he doesn't win the belt, but, like, that puts JBL over even more. It's the old Bruno finish. Right. And, like, maybe, maybe that's kind of what they were trying to go with with that Brock Lesnar-Randy Orton match, but... Oh, that was a pretty sick amount of blood, too. But that's why we invented the blade, because it's supposed to be safer, except when you cut way too deep and maybe take aspirin before the match, too. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the match uh, keeps going. Uh, JBL gets him in a sleeper. He gets out with a black backdrop suplex. Eddie looks like Wolfpack Sting at this point in the match. <laughs> he really does. Uh, Eddie counters a fallaway slam with a DDT. He goes for the frog splash, but he misses. Uh, JBL brings in the belt and a chair. He throws the chair in the ring so that the referee goes to put the chair out and goes to hit Eddie with the belt. Eddie kicks him in the junk and waffles him with the belt in front of the referee. And finish. Um, I, you know, ne- a DQ finish on a pay-per-view is never ideal, but I think it kind of fit this feud that Eddie would kind of lose control and get disqualified. Yeah, I mean, and I don't have any real issue with the way that this ended but that may just partially be because whenever i watch this match and i do so very irregularly because i it's too much especially knowing that eddie dies later just seeing him like this like i think both me and the crowd are ready for the match to be over like and the crowd's still going crazy but i mean there's there seems to be a sense like when eddie finally does this the crowd like kind of explodes like thank god finally you just hit him and we can move on (laughs) Absolutely. Um, yeah, you're just thankful that this is over. Except then they fight some more after the match, too, because we have... Eddie hits JBL with the belt again, then he hits him with two nasty chair shots, 
and then he hits the frog splash. Uh, referees try to help JBL away. Eddie jumps him in the aisle, and finally, a badass crew of agents, including Dean Malenko, Arn Anderson, and Fit Finlay, get them apart because nobody fucks with Fit Finlay. It's that Braun Strowman. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do love that this is Fit Finley, like, retired as a backstage agent, and two years after this, they fi- or a year or two after this, they finally bring him back and actually have him wrestle. Which is fantastic, yeah. They could have used him here. No, oh, they goddamn sure could have. Um, but yeah, it's actually fascinating that this is how it starts, because however you might feel about the match and all the blood and stuff, like, this is a hot start to a feud. Like this is this felt like this could have been a blow off match almost if Eddie had just actually won it, and then eventually a couple months later they'll actually blow this feud off in a Texas bull rope match that JBL will accidentally win. Yeah, like they start off so hot and it will end so mildly that it's just it sucks. Uh, this I, this is really a great match though, and I wouldn't say it, it makes the show not tear like i don't think people left the arena feeling like they got ripped off even though most of the show was really bad just because this main event was so great and ended on such a high note with eddie celebrating yeah i mean if i had been there i I would have been pretty happy just with the eddie thing but having to just watch it i can't say that i agree (laughs) yeah well, if you're going to watch this show, I'd say the only thing to check out is the main event because the rest of it is either forgettable or just outright terrible. Oh, yeah. Like, literally, if we hadn't been doing a podcast on this, I would have turned it off at least seven different times during the middle during that run in the middle of the show. Or just like, yep, that sucks. Offensive. That sucks. Bigoted. Horrible. Garbage. <laughs> yeah. So a this was universally panned at the time as you know worst pay-per-view ever i don't think it's quite that bad but i understand how people felt that way it's just people were so mad about jbl being in the main event that they weren't going to accept anything that he did even though i this match is now i think in retrospect remember it is a pretty great brawl yeah it's actually funny when would you say that at least like the internet fans started to get on board with JBL because there was a point After at which everybody was kind of like before he lost the title where like you started to see people coming out of the woodwork being like actually JBL's run is at the best of all time like when the yeah. contrarians got a hold of it because I remember being there and I wasn't one of them for once but I remember it yeah, I mean, I would say right around when he lost the title or after he did, I think once he didn't have the title and he wasn't you know, the top guy forever and ever, people were you know, willing to accept it. Like when he feuded with Batista and they had some pretty good matches, I think by that point, everybody was just like, ah, this guy's a good, useful part of the show. Right, I agreed. So, yeah, I think that pretty much wraps us up for JBL, or for, well, yeah, for JBL Mania, <laughs> Judgment Day 2004. Um, I, I will say I don't think Jinder Mahal and Randy Orton are going to have match that's good at Backlash. Nope, but honestly, uh, if you put a gun to my head, I think Jinder Mahal is a better choice for the main event than JBL was then. Why is that? There's... There's less pressure on main eventers now than there was then. Like, Definitely. you were asking JBL to actually be a top flight main eventer with no proof that he could actually do it against a babyface who had also never proved that he could actually do it. So, it was a bad idea to go with a heel, like a completely untested heel against a completely untested face like that. And there wasn't, Jinder Mahal's been in the mid card for a couple of years, but he hasn't been definitively mid card. 10 years and like a number of different gimmicks and he hadn't been so definitively set in a gimmick like JBL was with the APA. So not only is there no evidence he'll work as a heel, there's no evidence that he'll be convincing to people as not being part of the APA. There's no convincing that he'll be able to pull off the super racist angle. Like it's a lot of assumptions. Whereas gender, he has a lot more to work with. Uh, He's a lot more like he can, make a new character and have that be the definitive character that we know him as. There's just a lot more 
freedom to do different stuff with him than it seemed like there would have been for JBL at the time. And in the network era, they don't have to sell this pay-per-view. Like yeah. here, people actually had to pay 40 bucks to see this match, whereas exactly. now it's just $10 for your subscription and you'll get another pay-per-view the month anyway. Yeah, truth be told, who gives a shit who's in the main event? If AJ Styles is on the show, that's the main event. Like, if they do Randy Orton versus Jinder Mahal afterwards, it doesn't matter. I don't think they'll put that on last. I think they may actually put Nakamura on last. They should. They absolutely should. But, yeah. Um, you know, that, I think, wraps up our coverage of Judgment Day 2004. I'd say not as bad as its reputation, but still a pretty bad show. Hated it. <laughs> I actually think that um, Great American Bash, though, in a couple months is worse, much worse. So there is yeah, that. because it doesn't have this great match, and it has Paul Bear being killed. Murdered on screen. <laughs> Oof. All right, so I guess next week we're going to be talking about King of the Ring 1996. What, what are you excited to talk about with that show? I'll tell you what, I've never seen it. I've seen uh, the famous Steve Austin promo, obviously, but I've never actually seen anything about the show. I've never even seen any of the matches. So I'm really looking forward to seeing not only that era of wrestling, which I was watching TV but never got to see the pay-per-views, but I'm just fascinated to see in context the rise of Steve Austin. It's what is remembered as one of the most important moments in professional wrestling history. I would argue it's hugely overhyped in that respect, but we'll talk about that next week, along with Shawn Michaels against the British Bulldog and the first meeting of The Undertaker and Mankind. It's a very good pay-per-view, and I'm looking forward to breaking it down. Um, any last words before we finish up here? Uh, hell no. Uh, remember to, uh, I don't know, eat your vegetables, etc., and please, 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 uh, if we do polls again for shows, as we did last week, uh, stop voting for the crap shows you know are crap on purpose, guys. I know who you are. It's not all of you, but I see you out there. Stop it. I was shocked that Spring Stampede 2000 didn't win. Every time I run a poll, the crappiest possible show wins. But every time you run a poll, they actually care. I see what y'all are doing. You just hate me. <laughs> Indeed, they do. Well, all right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.